I believe that. You believe that? It's why I'm here. It's what pulls me here. It's what keeps me coming here. Honestly, that's what keeps me getting up in the morning. Isn't that what keeps you getting up? He is the resurrection and the life. Praise God. He has come for us. Uh, Frank, I appreciate your struggle. Uh, I'm not even going to try and joke this time. <laughs> this, this morning we're dealing with a heavy story. We're dealing, dealing with a very threat to our lives. The very center of the threat of all things. Death itself. You know, I, I will tell you just a little story about laughter, though. The hardest I ever laughed in my entire life, I think, was at my father's funeral. How weird is that, huh? I wasn't laughing because of something funny that happened. I was laughing because I was nine years old. And before the funeral got started, as people were showing up, I was off in this little side room just being by myself. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with myself, honestly. It was, it was weird. It's hard to believe that this was real, that this was really happening, that Dad was really gone. And I'm just sitting in that room struggling with that, and people were coming in, and they'd see me off in that room. There's a Coke machine in that room. And the people were coming in and they were going, man, I'm so sorry, buddy. Let me buy you a Coke. <laughs> and so I got a Coke and I, you know, they were these little 10 ounce bottles that you came out of the machine that you pulled out, you know, and I drank that and put it in the recycling bin. Thank you. Sat back down. A couple minutes later, someone came in and saw me sitting in there. Oh, buddy, I'm, I'm so sad. Let me buy you a Coke. I think I drank like six Cokes. And, you know, I was a little bitty kid. I didn't drink Coke, you know. And, and before the wedding, I mean the wedding, the funeral <laughs> gets started, I was on such a sugar buzz that I was laughing at everything. But it wasn't healthy laughter. It was a weird laughter. It was strange. Because I was there in a strange place Facing strange things. It was strange days. It's funny what your, what your memory will hang on to. One of my dad's favorite songs was To Canaan's Land, I'm on my way. It's funny how memory can stir your heart, isn't it? And uh, what I remember, we sang that song. And there was a lady sitting behind us singing the tenor line and it ticked me off. Because that was supposed to be the guys, you know? And you don't, just stop, you know? This is my dad's favorite song. Cut it, cut it. And, you know, it's burned into me, that anger. That, it was such a weird emotional day. Nothing felt appropriate or right or whole. And there was a feeling that, you know, from now on, nothing's going to be. Nothing's ever going to really fit in this world again. Because my dad is gone. Have you been there? Have you felt the sting of death as it struck your heart? If it hasn't, live a little. I wish I could say that, you know what, the good news of the Gospel is that you will never suffer. The good news of the Gospel is that all suffering is overcome in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That He can conquer whatever you go through. But you will go through it in this world. Am I right? It is a lie to tell you, don't worry, God will make everything okay. Don't worry, those bad things you're afraid of, they won't happen. That's not the Gospel. The Gospel is those bad things that you're afraid of are very likely to happen, but they're nothing to be afraid of because God loves you and will get you through every single one. The Gospel is that God will rescue us. But we may have to walk through the fire first. But when you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. When you walk through the waters, you will not be overwhelmed because He will go through it with us. But has it ever felt like He doesn't? Have you ever been at that moment when, he, when you desperately need Him because you're afraid something bad is about to happen? 
and He doesn't show up? Have you been there? Where you had to wonder, where are you right now? C.S. Lewis writes about grief after the death of his, of his wife, Joy. And he writes about it and he says, why is it that when everything's going well in life, you can go to the house of God and there's a celebration going on. But in your hour of need, when you are desperately afraid and desperately in need, you go and you knock on the door and all you hear is the bolts clicking shut. The windows are all dark and you find yourself standing alone out in the cold and wondering, was there ever anybody in here at all? Have you been there? Despair and trouble and pain can shake us to the core. And we live in a world of mourning and of grief and of tears. And what answer is there, God, to this world of pain? Where are you? Have you been there? This morning, we encounter Jesus Christ right there with the truth that He is there. Even when it seems that He has abandoned us. He hasn't. If you got your Bibles this morning, open up to John chapter 11. We're going to be looking in John chapter 11 at Jesus' encounter with death itself. Encountering the death of His friend and the mourning of His friends so that we can see how He comes to us when we also face mourning and pain and trouble and death. As we've been walking with Jesus through the Gospel of John, we have already seen that He is a really cool guy, right? He comes to us and He smashes our self-sufficiency and all of our knowledge and all of our self-confidence and He says, you got to be born again. He says that to us with Nicodemus. And He comes to us in all of our brokenness to let us know that we are not rejected. He knows every bit of the trouble in us and yet He still welcomes us to Himself. He's come to us and challenged us to be serious about our own need and not to reject His work in our life. And He has shown us what we can be with that blind man if we will just let Him work on us. We have seen that He is a great man. And quite honestly, if we stopped in John chapter 9, He would be worth following. He is better than any other philosopher or any other religious teacher that this world has ever offered. He does more for life right here and now than anyone else can. But honestly, if it stopped right there, we would still face trouble that every other philosophy and religion cannot deal with, and that is the trouble of death. That dislocated feeling that the world will never be the same again because the one that I love is gone. And not only that, but it looms over all of us, doesn't it? It's coming for all of us. You know, there have been millions and billions of people alive on planet Earth since it started spinning. You know what all of them have in common? Death. I mean, there's some of them that don't have that in common yet, but on a long enough timeline, the survivability of the human race eventually gets to zero. Right? We all must face this thing. And if Jesus offered us meaningful life right here and now, He'd be worth being with. He would. But He comes to us today to say, Oh, I offer you so much more than that. The story begins with a certain man from the village of Bethany. A man named Lazarus. A man with two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Mary is the one who wiped Jesus' feet with her hair after anointing. Now, incidentally, we don't get that until chapter 12. But the church has got to know that, right? That's who this is. And after he does what he does, you'd want to do that too, right? But this is a person, these are not just anybody's. 
You know, these are, these are, this is not just a woman at the well. When we're introduced to these people, these are people he knows. These are people he's friends with. He's been to their home. He's eaten in their house. These are people that he knows and loves. So it makes sense for these two sisters that when their brother gets sick, they send word. I mean, we know it's been dangerous, Jesus. We know that Bethany's pretty close to Jerusalem, and the people there want to kill you. We know that. But we need you. Please come back. Just just come back and leave. That'd be fine. Or in fact, just say the word. That's okay. But the one that you love is sick. And please, help us out. Have you ever been in their shoes where you were afraid and you prayed? Please, come. Because this is what I need. I know what I need and it's this. Please do this for me. That's where they are right here. And when Jesus hears their request, He says, well, this, this isn't going to end in death. Now, He's not lying to them. That doesn't mean there won't be death in the meantime. You know, in the middle of the story, there's death. But this sickness isn't going to end in death. It's for God's glory so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Now, if you're His disciples, you've got to be going, whew, good. Good. Dodged a bullet there. Because I know we love them, you know, but they're really close to a danger zone. And it, I don't want to go back there. So you've already seen Jesus pull this trick where he just says the word and somebody gets better. So if you're his disciples, you've got to be going, whew. Now the scripture is interesting because it points out that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. But when he hears that he's sick, he stays put for two days and in fact those two realities are connected it is because he loves them that he stays put it is because he loves them that he does not do what they asked for because if he did what they asked for sure Lazarus would get better but Lazarus would die again and what he wants to give them is something better and that is confidence in the truth that He can overcome what all of humanity faces. So it's going to be a better thing that He gives them. It's because of His love that He doesn't do it. Of course, they're not going to experience it that way, but we'll get to that in a minute. After two days, He says, all right, let's go back to Bethany so we can take care of Lazarus. And His... His friends are all going to say, uh, Lord, <laughs> uh, bad idea. Reality check here. Uh, just a short time ago, they were picking up rocks to kill you. Do not go there. <laughs> There's no reason for us to go there. That's a very bad idea. So, no, 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 Lord, no. And he says, well, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going there so I can wake him up. And the disciples assume he's talking about natural sleep, and they say, um, Lord, this is a bad errand. If he's sleeping, it's going to get better. Let's, why would we want to go wake up a sick person so that you know, they're, need, they're doing what they need? Let them sleep. And besides, we don't need to go there. They're trying to kill you. Let's not do this. So Jesus tells them plainly, our friend Lazarus has died. But... Let's go also. Let, let's go and, and wake him up. Now, if you're the disciples, Lazarus has died has got to be some of the worst words you hear during the entire ministry. Because that does not make sense. Have you ever been there where God does not make sense? Where you face trouble that you can't make sense of? Where you say, okay, well, I know that the Bible says that you are a good and loving God. And I know that the Bible says that you can do anything. And yet, this just happened. And I'm having trouble putting that together with this. See, all the people in the story are going to go through that. All of them. And the disciples hear that and they got to be going, What? What do you mean Lazarus died? You said. You said. 
Have you ever been at that point where you're saying to God, but you promised, but you said, my life shouldn't be like this because you said you would take care of me. My life shouldn't be going this way, but you said. That's where they are. I hope that when I find myself in those moments, I have the faith of doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas. How would you like to get stuck with a nickname for the worst thing that you ever did? Right? Oh, there's embezzling Sally. There's lying Larry. Yeah. Well, I just told him one lie. Can we let it rest? You know, he doubts one time and he's doubting Thomas forever. And you know what he says right here? And this is not a moment of doubt. This is a moment of loyalty. He ought to be loyal, Thomas. Because everything says that they are going to Jerusalem to die. Just, you know, just a few verses earlier, they're picking up rocks. You know, we barely got out of there with our skins. And now we're going back into the danger zone? Are you kidding me? And we're going for a fool's errand. The man's dead. I mean, when he's sick, sure, you can do something about it. But this man is dead. This is dumb. But he's still worth being with. And so let's go too. So that we can die with him. I wish I had as much faith as doubting Thomas had. I want that kind of faith that says whatever it costs, if that's where he is, that's where I want to be. I want to be with him wherever he takes me. And even if it's into terrible trouble, and even if it's into dreadful threat, if that's where he goes, that's where I'm going to. And even if I'm quite certain that I'm going to die, that's faith. Undoubting Thomas's part. So off they go, and when they get there, they find a big funeral, right? And Bethany's not all that far from Jerusalem. A lot of people have come to comfort these two sisters in the loss of their brother. While Jesus is still a ways out of town, Martha hears that Jesus has come, and she gets up and she goes. I suspect she's going in part, to prepare Jesus for what He's going to find when He gets to her, sis her sister. Because Mary is a wreck. These two women are going to show us two very different approaches to grief and to suffering. Martha is very intellectual. She knows all the right things to say. I don't know how much she really can believe it while she's saying it. And I say that because it's something she says towards the end of the story. But at least she has all the right words. When she gets to Jesus, she comes to Him with an accusation. Lord, if You had but been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Now, she says that. I don't know that she believes that. Because there are things that you just don't ask of God. You know, death is a reality and we've all seen it. You ever been to a funeral? You ever talked to that person afterwards? And there's a rock in Tennessee and I've sometimes gone there and I've talked to the ground. I've talked to him and I've, I've thought, what would you think of me? I want you to be proud. What would you think? What, do you, what would you think of the woman I married? What would you think if you saw my kids? You know, my youngest son has your eyes. Wish you could have looked at him with them. But afterwards, yeah, there are things you just don't ask of God. You know, so he'll do whatever you ask. I'm sure somehow he'll, he'll, you'll have something to say that'll get us through this, but I gotta tell you, I don't understand you. I don't know why you wouldn't come. You healed people who didn't even like you, people who didn't even respond to you, you were good to them. And boy, I cooked you manicotti. Why couldn't you love me? Why are you so good to strangers and you forget your friends? Where are you, God, when we need you? But 
I know that if you'd been here, it would have gone better than it's going now, but I'm still going to try and trust you. Jesus says to her something amazing. Something that, you, you know, that people sometimes say at funerals. They said in the end, you know. Except what he means is, I'm going to interrupt this funeral. Your brother will rise again. Now he means in about an hour. <laughs> but she hears it and she thinks, I am affirming the theological truth. You shouldn't be so sad. Death is a liar, Mar Martha. Death tells you, Martha, that this is forever, but it's not. That's all she thinks he's saying. And so she says, yeah, I know. I believe in the resurrection. You see, by the time Martha's around the resurrection, the resurrection is not an exclusively Christian belief. It kind of came about because the Jews had gone through so much injustice and so much oppression, and they had these promises from God that everything was going to go well for them, and they said, well, it must not be in this life. This world's too broken. The ways of Adam are too strong. So God will raise the dead, but He's going to keep His promises. And so lots and lots of Jews, not all of them, but lots of Jews believed in the resurrection. And Jesus, I'm sure, was a resurrection teacher. Good friends with this woman, and she's heard Him talk about resurrection, and she's saying, yeah, great. But see, you know, that's really not what I needed. What I really needed was you to love me and you to take care of me. I don't just need a theological platitude, Jesus. I needed your help and you weren't here. So I'll wait for the last day. And I know that's true. And thank you for telling me that. But today it doesn't really help. You know, she thinks she's hearing one of those things that people say at funerals. You ever heard those things that people say at funerals? What they're trying to do is fix you and make you so you don't hurt anymore because your hurting makes them uncomfortable so they say stupid things. You know, like, like oh, well, your son needed to go be with God because God needed him more than you do. Really? Really? God has needs? Is that right? You know, well, your baby's an angel now. Really? Yeah, because, you know, I thought that was a baby who was supposed to live with me and grow up. But thanks. I actually had someone tell me one time, uh, th this pain you're in right now will make you a better minister. I'm like, really? Okay, thanks. Okay, if one of your kids dies so that you can be a better accountant? You know, th this, this <clears throat> that's what she thinks she's dealing with. And she says, I know, I know that. Thanks. And Jesus tells her the truth. No, 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 Martha. You don't understand. I have done all of this because I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? Do you believe the truth of this? That, he, that even if he die, yet shall he live. Do you believe it? That this death thing that looks like it's forever and that it looks like it's over, that it looks like it's a rock with grass growing in front of it when once there was churned earth, it's not permanent. It says it's permanent, but it's not because Jesus is the resurrection and He is the death defeater. He overcomes the greatest trouble that faces all of us. He can do it. He will do it. And we live with that promise. And He's going to prove it in this story today. Well, what she says is, well, Lord, I believe that You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God that's come into the world. And I'm, I'm trying to believe that. I believe that you've, what, what You've shown me about Yourself is true. You being the resurrection, I don't know. I'll do the best I can with that. But see, there's a, there's a cave over there with a rock in front of it and my brother's inside of it. And you could have done something about it and you didn't. So, I don't know. It's hard to believe you're good when you let a thing like that happen. You ever been there? That's where she is. So then she goes and she gets her sister. Now Martha's intellectual. She's willing to have an argument, a discussion, a debate. She's willing to try and process her faith, I mean her, her pain through her thoughts. That's not Mary. That's not Mary at all. 
Mary hears that Jesus is here and she gets up and she goes running. And when they, the other people see this, they follow, which is just great, so that this scene of dreadful pain ends up with an audience. And they go running out, and when Martha comes, or rather when Mary comes, she doesn't come to have a discussion with Jesus. She just comes to accuse Him. She just comes to tell Him that He's bad, that He failed her, that He let her down. He, she comes and she throws herself at His feet and she says, Lord, if You had been here, my brother would not have died. And floating underneath those words is, where were You? Where were You? Have you ever cried out that to God? Where are You? I sent for You. I prayed. And You didn't deliver. And here's this dead body to prove it. Where were you? Where are you when I hurt? I need you and you seem so far away. That's where she is. And it says that Jesus is deeply moved. Now folks, you need to hear that. That when you are just absolutely destroyed. Jesus is not aloof. He does not stand far off. No matter what your heart tells you. No matter what Satan tells you. He accuses you and He accuses God. And He tells you that God is no good. That God has abandoned you. That you are alone. That there is no hope. That, he, that, that everything that you hoped for and dreamed for is gone. He will tell you all those lies. But Jesus is close to the brokenhearted. He does not stand far off. He steps into our grief with us. What is the shortest verse in the Bible? You memorized it, didn't you? When you were a kid to get that sticker. You know, this is one I won't have to work all that hard on. Jesus wept. Absolutely. Now think about that for a moment. Why on earth would He weep? He knows what He's there to do. It's been in His mind from the very beginning. The moment the messengers came, He said, okay, here's my opportunity to show everyone that I am stronger than death. Do you honestly think He's mourning the loss of His friend? Is He in pain because of this death? Jesus is weeping because He steps into our trouble with us. Our God is not far away. And when you feel broken, and when you feel hopeless, when there are tears on your cheeks, you must know, you must believe that Jesus weeps with you. Not because He is powerless, not because He can't accomplish good, but because of His great love. He's willing to step into it with you that He might lead you out of it. And so when you are there in trouble and you feel like He's so far away, you must know that Jesus is moved and troubled and, and His Spirit is going out toward you with great compassion. And so when you're in that devastated place where you can't even talk, where you're doing well to get out one sentence and that's all you got, know that He is not far away from you. He is the best friend you've got, especially when you grieve. Because he, He's moved together with you. But the time for mourning is done. And this story is finished. At that point, when Jesus grieves together with her, He has moved to be good to her. And to all of them. And so He says, where have you laid them? They take him to the grave and he says, All right, get that rock out of the way. Roll away that stone. Now, this is why I've told you that Martha didn't really believe. She believed, but she didn't really believe. You ever been there? Where your faith, you know it's right. And yet at the same time, your reality is so hard to reconcile with it. Well, that's where she is because she says, Lord, it's been four days. If you move that rock, there's going to be a bad order. And can you see the condition of my sister? Do you really think that she needs to smell his body decaying? Don't, don't do this to us, please. 
Now, if she believed what he said, that I am the resurrection and the life, if she believed that, she'd be like, oh, oh, that's what this is all about. She believes. But it's just so hard to believe. And when you stand there by the ruins of your dreams and you stand there by the brokenness of your life and you want to say to God, what now? What can you possibly do? And when He starts to move and you see the direction He's going, have you ever gone, whoa, 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 wait, not there. I'm not ready for that. I'm not prepared. Well, Jesus in those moments actually will do something fairly, fairly surprising in a funeral. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've done a lot of them. You know what you, the big ministerial goal of a funeral is? Is to help people find comfort and to help people celebrate this life and to help people grieve, to walk through the deep pain. You know what you don't do? You don't yell at people at funerals. Not if you're any good at your job, right? But if you hear what, she, what he says to her, it's a pretty harsh rebuke. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? It's like, I told you to believe. Now do it here where it matters right now. Because He is dead in there right now. But you get that rock out of the way, and He won't be. So they roll away the stone. I suspect they were rather surprised. I suspect they were like, don't make this guy mad. Just move the rock. And then he stands there and he prays. And he tells, the, tells his father, Father, I, I thank you have heard me. I know you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people listening right now that they may know that you have sent me. Okay? Now that's a big prayer, folks. Because what he's doing is he's praying for our faith. And he's praying for the faith of the people standing there. He's praying for your faith too. Because God knows that when you face trouble, it is hard to continue to believe. Do you know one of the reasons you need to come here? is so that you can encounter Jesus among His people. And we can believe for you when you're having trouble believing. We can pray. We can carry you through. It takes, fa- it takes prayer to keep believing when you face trouble. And Jesus prays this prayer knowing good and well that He can just raise the guy. But He prays this first so that we know what to do when we face the open grave. And then He says, Lazarus, come out. And some of the most amazing words in Scripture. The dead man... Get that? The dead man came out, his face covered and his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen. And Jesus says, undo those burial clothes. You let him go. He doesn't need those anymore. Which, honestly, he says that to each of us when we come to him to die. Right? And there's water right here. What is baptism about? It's about joining Christ in death. What's the rest of your life about after that? Taking off the burial clothes. Putting them down. Because you don't need them anymore. Because you were dead and now you're alive. You were lost and in your sins and now you're resurrected. You've joined Christ in resurrection. And that's what Jesus is showing us in Lazarus. That I have the power to do this to people. Which is why I can stand on that grave and talk to him sometimes. I know that's weird. But I'm doing that because I'm getting ready to talk to him again someday. It's practice for when I see him again. Those are questions I want answers to. I will get my answers. Because the Lord my God is able to raise the dead. And one day He will say, Bobby Brown, get up. You've been there long enough. And one day He will call to your loved one by name. Get up! Come on! Join me! It's time to live again. And if the Lord doesn't come for another thousand years, He'll call your name too. And Unless you plan to live a thousand years. I don't 
plan to be around, you know. So if you're still alive a thousand years from now, have fun with that. But I'm sure, I'm sure that he is going to, a thousand years from now, or ten thousand, or however long he waits, when he comes again, it is to call us from the tomb. To call us out of the grave. And this is why it's worth following him. Because show me another person who can do that. I can't do that. If I could do that, you would be introduced to my father. I can't do it, but he can. And he did this as a down payment, as a promise to show that he will. And in fact, then, just a few chapters later, he faced it himself. He went through this exact same experience himself, and he also left the grave clothes behind, folded them up, and set them down before he walked away. This is a man who conquers death. Now I said earlier that, that if he could do none, you know, if he couldn't do this, if you just had the first stuff, it'd be worth following him. Quite honestly, if this is all he gave us, he'd be worth following. But you know what? He gives us the whole package. Life here and eternal life tomorrow. Praise God. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who lives, though he die, yet shall he live. And any doggone it. That would be more dramatic if I could quote it correctly. <laughs> Let me just read it, because I've butchered it four times in this sermon. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I believe this. And I know because I know this is true, I can, I can stand here and proclaim for him life eternal. Now, it may be that you haven't started your walk with him. And maybe there's somebody here who hasn't joined him in death and resurrection through the waters of baptism. And if that's you, boy, today would be a really good day to do that, wouldn't it? You know, if you've been waiting around and thinking maybe someday I'll get around to that, boy, you've got right now. But Lazarus died, right? You don't know that you got forever. There's water right here. And you can have this promise as yours today if you want it. That, do you believe it? And if today you came to this place bearing a burden that you don't need to carry out of here, then don't. Christ through His people will take it. We will pray for you. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing. measure what your word